as you see on the on the title slide, I've called this from creation to salvation, a journey through the Hebrew Bible. And so tonight, a lot of what we'll talk about is that last phrase, the Hebrew Bible. What does that mean when I say that? Am I talking about something else or the same thing? So we'll get to that. But, but to help us kind of set the stage, this is the audience participation portion of the night. Quickly, just a few, tell me one of two things, either your favorite passage story account in the Old Testament, or when you think about the Old Testament, what are themes that come to mind? Either one. 23rd Psalm. 23rd Psalm. Just mark it. Any story about the tabernacle. The tabernacle. Okay. More so than the temple? Or you both? More so the tabernacle. Gotcha. Creation. Creation. Okay. Start at the very beginning. It's a very good place. Start. Because I learned my love of musicals from Denise. I'm sad. If you like Psalm 25. Okay. Psalm 25. Are you? I don't know what it said, Jim. Janet said still small voice. Still? Okay, yes. I, I hear it in the uh, nativity movies. Yeah. Nativity story movies. What you got, Ms. Pam? I like the process. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Fascinating section. Good. So, so there's a lot in the Old Testament, or Hebrew Bible, as I'm calling it. Here, here's what I want us to do, and I have no idea how long this is going to take. Now, tonight it's going to take an hour. <laughs> so I'm not saying we're doing it all tonight. I don't know how long we'll be in this. So for the first week, two, three, seven, we're going to look at sort of overview ideas, background ideas, that sort of thing about the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible. And then we will spend some time looking at individually an overview of each book. Um, so we'll try to put that together. And then at the end, we'll kind of look back and see what we can pull together from what we've studied. Okay, so that's kind of where we're going. Um, why do we want to do this? Well, one of the things that, that sometimes we think of, we say Bible, and we think this, right? I could be like Vince Lombardi, the first day of practice with the Green Bay Packers when he says, gentlemen, this is a football. I could say, ladies and gentlemen, actually, mostly ladies, isn't it? Um, this is a Bible, and well, the first part is the Old Testament. You would think, you know, that, that's very basic. Um, but, but that's in some ways what we're going to try to do over the course is to look uh, on a, a different way at looking at this. What we take for granted when we say Bible in the modern times is a book. We're a, we're a culture that these were well, not as important today as they were maybe 15, 20 years ago. But, you know, this, this kind of document is normal for us. This so when we say Bible, we think of a bound volume that contains the 66 books that we have, Old Testament, New Testament. This is a very modern Bible. When Jesus walked the earth, they didn't have these. In fact, nobody had a Bible. When you think about it, the, the, the temple the tabernacles, the synagogues, those sorts of places that people gathered would have copies, not of this, but of scrolls that were stored in very ornate cabinets. We saw some, saw one very nice one under the Western Wall of the Temple when we were uh, in Israel there. Um, and, and so part of what we need to do is as we approach this, if we can, Put aside our modern presuppositions about the Bible, about the Old Testament, and the things that we know, and try to take a fresh look at it, and specifically through, dare I say, the eyes of Jesus. Because what we call the Old Testament was the Bible, the scriptures of Jesus when he walked this earth. Um, you know, it, it's tempting as Christians 
to, to spend a lot of time. You know, we go through the, in the Old Testament, there's some weird stuff in there. Is that fair? Yes. I mean, just odd stuff. In there. And it's, you know, we get to the New Testament, and, and, oh, Jesus, and his life, and death, and resurrection, and church, and, and, and sometimes when we get to the New Testament, Paul, you know, Paul is didactic. It's, it's a letter. It's instruction. You can open it up and say, oh, this is what it's saying. This is what I'm supposed to do. But you can't do that when you open an Old Testament history volume or an Old Testament poetic work. You're like, well, what am I supposed to do with this? How, how, do, how do I understand? What does this mean? And so what we want to do over the course of our time together is try to give some tools to help us be able to do that when we open up literature that, first of all, comes from a different culture. Hebrew Bible, as I called it here, um, one of the reasons it's called the Hebrew Bible is because it was written in Hebrew, Hebrew right? <laughs> and while we are grateful that we have an English copy of Scripture, we also have to understand that the process of translating from one language to another involves interpretation. Translation is interpretation. And we'll look at a few of those things even tonight where we see how the modern translations have maybe roughed or actually smoothed over some roughness in the text that we miss because we're reading a translation, not seeing the original. Uh, and so we, we're coming from a different language, a different culture, uh, and, and a different geography, a different historical era. And so what we want to do is, is again, put aside our modern presuppositions are because the temptation whenever we open the text and read it is we read it from the perspective of a 21st century person and we say what does this have to say about whatever the modern thing is well i think before we can say what does this have to say about this we have to say what was it saying then when we find out what it's saying then then we're better able to understand what it might say in a different cultural and linguistic and historical context. And so we're going to try to go back and get some of that. Now, let me start with a couple of scriptures. Um, I, I should have put them. Uh, this one's not in red letters, but, but this is one of my favorite scriptures. Uh, this section, Luke 24, is the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus. And this particular scripture in verse 27 comes from the, the account where he's on the road to Emmaus. A little background. Jesus has resurrected, and he comes upon these people and asks them, what's, what's going on? Why is everybody so stirred up? And they're like, haven't you heard? Newsflash, he knew. <laughs> it was about him. Haven't you heard what happened? And they kind of tell him, and, 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 and then he takes a, a walk with them for a while. They don't recognize it's Jesus. And, and it says in that passage, in beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. So Jesus spends time with these individuals on the road to Emmaus, showing them what the Bible says about him. But the Bible that he was using didn't have Matthew, didn't have Mark, didn't have Luke, didn't have John, didn't have Acts or Romans or any of the Pauline epistles or the general epistles or rebel, it had none of that stuff. It was Moses and the prophets. A little bit later in that same chapter, he's talking to his disciples and he, oops, verse 44, he tells his disciples this. He says, these are red letters, not on the screen, but in, in your copy of the text. This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Now, this is, a, this is pretty important for what we're going to do tonight, because this ties into the idea of why are we taking a journey through the Hebrew Bible? What does that mean, Hebrew Bible? Is it the same as the Old Testament? Yes and no. It's the same text. It's the same what we call 39 books of the Old Testament. But for the Hebrew Bible, it's only 24 books, not 39. Why? Did they get rid of 15 books of the Bible? No, they're in there. For instance, we have 1 Kings and 2 Kings. 
They just have kings. We have first Samuel, second Samuel. Have, you know why we have first kings and second kings? Anybody know? Because they can only fit so much on the <laughs> scroll. And so it's one continuous story, kings, Samuel, kings, chronicles, one continuous story, but there's, there's limits to how big they make the scroll. So they find a, a stopping place and they say, okay, that's one scroll. We're going to start a new scroll. And when later we, we come up with it, we say, well, these are two different things. Oh, it's one story in, in the Hebrew mind. For us, it's multiple. Um, the big difference is actually what, and we'll look at this more in just a minute, what, what we call the minor prophets, the last 12 books of the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Bible is one book. The book of the 12 is what it's called. It's one scroll. Again, different culture. We think book, they think scroll. We think something we can hold in our hand. They think something we have to build an ornate cabinet for to hold the large ornately uh, illustrated scrolls, uh, well designed and done. Um, and, and so it's, they're, 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 so it's the same, but it's not the same. Um, the other thing that's different is the order of the books. If, uh, have, this would be, I guess, my copy of the Hebrew Bible. You can see it doesn't say Bible on the front. It says Tanakh. Why is it called the Tanakh? So glad you asked. What did Jesus say to his disciples? I'm going to tell you. Uh, we'll go back and start a slide review. The law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. The reason this is called the Tanakh is because it's divided into three sections. The law, the prophets, and the writings. Um, so the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh in this case, follows that pattern that Jesus said. In fact, many scholars believe that verse shows us that this was the kind of order that Jesus was used to when he opened, actually didn't open, right? He was the word. He had it memorized. He knew it like all of the Jewish boys would. Um, when he referred to the scriptures, he was referring to that threefold division. Um, it's called the Tanakh because it's the first Hebrew letter of the three sections. The first section is the Torah. So Torah means teaching. We think of it as the law. Um, that's the Hebrew. How do you say that? You say that Torah. And you know, Hebrew reads the, the wrong way. You pick up a, I didn't bring my Hebrew Old Testament, but when you start a book in Hebrew, you start at the back. So all of you novel people that like to read the end first, in Hebrew, you're, you're saying, right? So you start at the back. It, it reads right to left, not left to right. Um, so the T is this, and, and it goes that way. So Torah, so the T shows up. Um, the prophets... The Hebrew word is Nevi'im, nevi um, and again, the N shows up there. And the third section, the writings, are the Ketuvim. Um, Im is plural uh, in Hebrew, so prophets, plural, writings, plural, hello. I'm so sorry. Uh, so the reason it's called the Tanakh, traditional Hebrew order, is because it's using those first letters, T and K, to make a word. It's not really a word, it's Tanakh. Um, the Torah, the teaching, the law, the prophets, and the writing. As Jesus said, the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Um, so can anybody say the books of the Old Testament in order? Oh, just I can get halfway through. I can't choose. Halfway, maybe. Yes. Here they are. This is when we talk about our English Old Testament, this is the order that they're in uh, traditionally. Actually, the only order as far as the Bible. Um, and they're divided like that. Uh, the law, the law is the law, the Torah, the Pentateuch, um, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Uh, and then the next section are, are largely historical books. Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. These are kind of historical, either 
telling of the history of the kings and the rulers or individuals that were significant in the history. Um, then we have call it wisdom or poetic literature, Job, Psalm, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. And then the final section are the prophets. We divide them into major prophets and minor prophets. Do I know why these are the major prophets? They're, that's it. They're, they're longer. And the, what we call the minor prophets, these 12 books, are one scroll or one book, the book of the 12, in the Hebrew Bible. So that's how we do it. Now, how did we get this? Why is this order not the same as the Tanakh? You're probably wondering what's the order of the Tanakh. Let's go there. How's that? So here is the order of the books of the Hebrew Bible. Starts with the law. The first five are the same. Then it goes to the prophets. And it's generally considered two groups of prophets. The former prophets and the latter prophets. The former, you would say Joshua. Well, that's history. More Judges, Samuel, Kings. Kings is definitely good king, bad king history. Latter prophets, these are ones that we would typically recognize as prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, uh, and then the minor prophets. Um, so that's the, the middle section, eight of them. And then the last section, the, the writings of the Ketubim, uh, Psalms defies kind of category. And then they're divided basically pre-exilic and post-exilic. Um, Job, Proverbs, Ruth, Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes written by main leaders of Israel before the exile to, to Assyria and Babylon. And then after the exile, we get Lamentations, Esther, or during or after the exile, Lamentations, Esther, Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah. Again, this is an Ezra, Nehemiah's one scroll. It's not two different books. And Chronicles. So 24 books in the Hebrew Bible, 39 books in the Old Testament, and they're they're like scrambled. So why is that? Are you wondering, or is that just me? Can you refer back to that again? Not as much. Okay. If anybody online wants, I could probably email them. Michael. That fly. Maybe they discover later on here and there, different time, period. Maybe that's why they different order. No, actually, no. Um, the, the Hebrew order is goes way back, several centuries before Christ. Before, before yeah. Christ, yeah. Um, organized. And this, there's minor deviations sometimes in the writing, um, depending on which version you get. Maybe they'll be moved around. But this order of the Hebrew Bible was well established before <laughs> Jesus came. This is kind of how it went. What happened was about the third century BC, here's how history plays into things. Um, you've got the Greek culture, Alexander the, the Great, right? And, and his conquest of the known world that makes Greek the primary language of most of the world, including the Holy Land. That's why the New Testament is written in Greek, not Hebrew. They were all Jewish people, but it was written in Greek because that was the common language. So because Greek is the common language, they said, we need the Old Testament in Greek. And so they, they made a, a Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. It's called the Septuagint. Uh, it's, if you ever see, if you're reading about biblical things and you see the Roman numeral 70, LXX, that's the Septuagint. It's called the Septuagint because there were 70 translators that worked on it. Um, there's actually another tradition that says um, there were seven members of six of the tribes of Israel. So that made 42 translators that worked on it independently. And when they brought their translations together, it was all perfectly matched, which you know sounds more like legend than, than maybe truth. But that's where it gets its name. The Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible that was that was there. And when they translated it, they changed the order. They went from this order to the previous order. And, and the primary kind of switcheroo to, um, what had to do with in here. Um, they put all the historic book history books together. Anything that seemed like it recorded history, they, they grouped together. 
Because if you notice on the, the, the thing here, we've got Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings. Those are more like history. But over here, we've got, you know, Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, some of these that are in the historical section of, wrong way, of, of the uh, Old Testament. So they, they reorganized it. They, they reordered it. Um, <coughs> they put these together, these wisdom or poetic literatures, and, and then they moved the prophets all in one long song. So that was the Septuagint. Well, a little bit later, after Jesus came, um, the predominant language went from Greek to Latin. And along the way, it was thought, we need a, a translation of the Bible in Latin. So Jerome comes along, and he translates the Latin Vulgate. Not Labello, for the record. <laughs> it was not Jerome Labello. <laughs> Although no, two of us are calling Jerome. I want to read that. Yeah. Read that translation. I, I <laughs> that would be something. Yes. Um, it was entertaining. So Jerome comes along. He translates the Bible, the entire Bible, into Latin, and he used the the um, Septuagint. <coughs> Excuse me. To create his Latin translation, and then. When we come fast forward several hundred centuries to the advent of the English translations, because the Latin kind of became the normative use translation because that was the prevalent language, it, that order was preserved when in the 14, 1500s, they began to try to translate the, the Bible into English. And some of them actually used the Hebrew text, but they followed the Septuagint and the Vulgate order. Aren't you glad to know that? Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> Good. There you go. So that's how that became that. But here's what we need to kind of have some confidence in. In that process, they didn't come up with a different Bible. It's the same. Joshua in the Old Testament is the same as Joshua in the Hebrew Bible is the same as Joshua in the Septuagint is the same as Joshua in the Bible. I mean, yes, trans that's several different languages. So translation kind of does some things that we go, oh, that's interesting. Um, maybe there's some, you know, because everything's written, you know, we're not just photocopying it. There's human error involved in some transcription errors, but it's the same book, the same story. It's not, nothing substantive changed in the text of the Old Testament, but it's kind of a fascinating thing to me that, that that did change. So let's talk for a few minutes about the order of the Hebrew Bible. Oops. I don't remember which way to go. This order that, that would be in the Tanakh or any kind of Hebrew Bible. I don't want to say which is better, but I want to point out some things about this order that is interesting that in the order that we think of might be lost. For instance, Many of you have probably tried to read through the Bible. And if you're if you're going in the, the order, you pick it up at Genesis and go to, to Revelation. Have you noticed that when you get here and here, you're like, these are the same stories. I got to read this again. <laughs> I just read that. What's going on here? Um, and that's not, that's assuming you get past the video, right? <laughs> <laughs> so this is like the, First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles are like the same stuff. In fact, if you've ever done um, the chronological through the Bible reading, which basically you can kind of take the order of the Old Testament and it it puts it like if, if you're reading in Kings about a king that's mentioned, or like let's say Samuel, you get to David, and you, you read song, parts of Psalms that David wrote after you read the story. Like you read Psalm 51 after you read the story of Bathsheba because they go together. It's a fascinating way. You see that, that there's all this historical kind of, of a mess there. Um, but sometimes we, we see that, that if you go to the, the order here, you've got Kings, the very last book in the Hebrew Bible is Chronicles. Totally. So, so you read, if you read through this, you're like, oh, that's kind of cool. And you read this and, and, and you go over here like, wait, 
This is like a summary of everything. You know the first word of the last book of the Hebrew Bible? Adam. Oh. So Chronicles summarizes the whole history of God and Israel. And, and here's the cool, well, I don't want to spoil it. I'll get the other one. So let's talk about some of the uniqueness of this particular order that we might miss in looking at the way we do it. Um, one, it brings together, we talked about this earlier, books that were separated. Uh, when you read, King, actually, Samuel and Kings, at one point it was numbered first, first and second Samuel were first Kings, second Kings, and third and second Kings were third Kings and fourth Kings. Kind of, they, they're thought to be kind of a continuous story. So it begins to bring together, and if you've read them, you know that that's kind of how it works, things that we separate. Um, to, when you see Chronicles, first and second Chronicles as a unit, Adam to returning from exile, you're like, oh, that's a different story when you just kind of, because if you start Chronicles, the first nine chapters of first Chronicles are the genealogy. It's like, oh, another one. But then it kind of picks up some pace later. So, so that's a, a unique feature of this. Ezra and Nehemiah, for instance, these are two contemporaries who work together in, in returning the people of God to Israel, to Jerusalem, rebuilding the wall and, and the revival that, that began under them. It brings them together. So that's that's one thing. Um, the, uh, the We see like over here, the latter prophets come just after Kings. So when, when you read Isaiah or Jeremiah, you're reading about, and it talks about this king or that king or the other king. You just read about them. They're together. That history that you just learned informs the prophetic moment that an Isaiah or Jeremiah steps onto the stage for. Um, we see, you know, this is a, another way that the, this, this pre-exilic and post-exilic division is fascinating um, because Ruth is in the days when the judges judged, right? Uh, and Esther is way over there uh, in the exile. She's one of the exiles. Um, uh, this, you know, two different stories, two different periods of history. So, so you can see some of the, the things going on there. Um, and, and here's here's another thing. Cool. Sorry about that. If that goes through. Just a reminder. Okay. <laughs> so, Proverbs thirty one. What's Proverbs thirty one? The virtuous woman, right? Have you? It, it doesn't it seem like it's kind of just hanging there at times. Like you've read Proverbs, you've got these couplets of yeah. wisdom literature, and then you get to Proverbs thirty-one, which is a wonderful passage. But you're like, what's this about? That's weird. In the Hebrew Bible, it says a virtuous woman, a godly woman. What's the next verse? Or what's the next book? Ruth. Ruth. And what's going after that? Ruth three eleven. You know what it calls Ruth? What's Proverbs thirty-one just told us about? There's a connection between that ending and the beginning or, or the story of Ruth. Um, we could go on to, let's see, uh, yeah, Ruth 311, if you keep your score at home, mentions that she is an excellent wife. Having just learned what an excellent wife is, here's a story about an excellent wife and a story about love and marriage. They go to here. I'm sorry, I'm not saying. Um, so, so it, it brings things together to show us that there are connections. Um, you've got the same thing here, like Lamentations is usually connected with right after Jeremiah in our kind of ordering, because Jeremiah wrote it. But it's it's the story of, of how horrible it is that they're in exile. And what comes after Lamentations? Two individuals who are living in that horrible exilic period who show that you can be faithful even when it costs you. No matter how bad Lamentations makes things sound, Esther and Daniel show, you know, Esther takes her life in her hands when she steps before the king. Daniel, thrown into the lion's den for being faithful to God, both of them these examples of faithfulness that's supposed to, I don't want to say dampen, you know, Kind of whatever tone you talk to us. So just to put you a step on. Okay. That kind of the downer tone 
that is there. So, so it, it kind of connects those things together, and then we come back and go from there. Um, let's see, what's next? Oh, the interesting order here also gives us a look at the priorities that that the people of God have. How does how does Genesis one start? In the beginning, yeah. <laughs> creation, right? And what's the agent of creation? God's word. God's word speaks. Let's let there be light. Um, how does Joshua start? Joshua one eight. What does it tell us to do? I know. No. Joshua one nine to be strong and courageous. Joshua one eight. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. So the, the whole story, the Torah, begins with this, this word that God speaks that, that enacts creation, that everything that is comes from his word. Joshua, the next section, the prophetic section, begins with a reminder that if you want to be successful, if you want to be prosperous and blessed in what you're doing, what do you do? You meditate, you keep the book of the law on your lips, meditate on it day and night, be careful to do everything written in it. And then the last psalm, Psalm 1, guess what it's about? His delight is in the law of the Lord, and on it he does meditate day and night, it's like a tree planted by rivers of water. Whose leave never withered, who brings forth fruit in season. It's, it's another, and, and chapter two could go with that, another callback. So, so you see this thematic moment that unites all of these that, that God creates by his word and institutes the law. And then his people come out of their obedience to the law and their, their ultimate prosperity is determined by their continued obedience to law. It's a thread that each of the first books connects to draw them all together. I think that's, that's a thing. Um, thing. Not only that, the ending of each section. Um, when we get to, to Deuteronomy, um, Deuteronomy is the second law. We'll talk more about that sometime in the future. Deuteronomy is the retelling of the law. It's kind of Moses' farewell address to his people. And, and in it, in chapter uh, 18, he talks about there will be another prophet that will come and you will listen to him. And, and then at the very end of Deuteronomy, the last verse, it says, since then, that's three verses, no prophet has risen in Israel. Like, chapter 18, there'll be a prophet coming. The end. Since then, chapter 34, verse 10, no prophet like Moses has arisen whom the Lord knew face to face, who did all the signs and wonders. For no one has ever shown the mighty power or performed the awesome deeds that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. So, so the the, the Torah, the Deuteronomy section, ends with this looking forward. There's going to be a prophet, but we haven't seen him yet. There's no one like Moses on the horizon. Um, we get to the end of the writings, Malachi, which is the last book in, in our Old Testament, but the last of the, the minor prophets has a, you might say, a similar tone, Malachi Chapter 4, verse 5. See, I will send the prophet Elijah before that day of the dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents of the children, the hearts of the children of their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. So the writing, I mean, the Nebian, the prophets in looking forward to what? A greater prophet. In this case, Elijah. By the way, that's one of the reasons um, that kind of works as the ending of all of the New Testament. Uh, historically, it's that beginning of the 400 years of silence, we sometimes call it, between the last prophet and the coming of, of Jesus, or more specifically, John the Baptist, and it points specifically to that reality to come. And then um, we get to the end of, of Chronicles, which is the last book of the Hebrew Bible, which is, you know, i got to flip back and forth um, to find it, Second Chronicles. Chapter 36 is a fascinating ending. So Deuteronomy ends by saying, yeah, Moses is great, but there's one even greater coming. 
Malachi ends by saying he's not here, but he's there's a prophet, he's coming. And and at the end of Chronicles, it ends with the proclamation of Cyrus, the great of Persia, saying, This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says The Lord, the God of heaven, had given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judea. Now, I'm not going to read the NIV because this is where one of those things that modern translations smooth what should be rough. Um, a, more, a more literal modern translation might be the New American Standard. And it says for the last sentence, whoever there is among you of all his people, may the Lord his God be with him and let him go up. It's actually an incomplete sentence, grammatically. It, it's, sort of a, it's sort of a hanging ending. And let them go up. So what, what is it? It's a, it's a promise. It's a, it's a prophetic moment looking forward. So each section starts by saying, follow the word of God, meditate on it, keep it on your lips. Each section ends by saying, there, there's, there's hope yet, there's more to come, there's another prophet, there's, there's, there's the ultimate temple that will come, the hope of the people. And so you see both at the beginning and ending, there's a connection that, that pulls these all together. Um, an interesting, another Thing. I mentioned Chronicles. How did I told you a minute ago? Chronicles, First Chronicles, one, one through nine, or so, or chapters one through nine, start with the genealogy. How does Matthew start with the genealogy? Right? Chronicles, the last book of the Hebrew canon, the Hebrew Bible, says, "Here's here's what's happening. We want you to know. Here, Adam, da da da, and then." When you open the New Testament, what does it start with? It picks that theme up. It, it begins to tie together these hanging moments at the end of the I may have a few recommendations. People of Israel would, would no. jump on that and, and connect the dots. Sorry, I didn't get that. The last one I have is Zoom. Would you like to try it? No. So, so I think that's a fascinating order when you think about it that way that, that shows things that, that I think for the Hebrew mind that, that kind of was raised on this order might see things that, that we don't. Um, one last, I, mean, I could do a few more, but I don't know if you care. <laughs> but I'm going to do more. It's only 640. Um, another thing, there, there's this throughout the through all, all three sections, the, there's this cycle that sort of comes up. And, and one scholar kind of labeled it this way creation, exile, return. So, creation, right? We know creation. What happens in chapter three? Exile, right? Now, that, that return is left hanging. We don't always get a return, but we always get. A hopeful promise that one day they will return. We go not too far later, and there's this guy Cain, who, you know, Adam and Eve exiled. Well, there's creation again, the creation of, of their children. And then Cain kills his brother Abel, and what happens to him? He's exiled. And again, left hanging. But go, go a little bit further that, that that's the first act of evil, and then evil just sort of ramps up and, and we get this moment where not so much the we can look at the art right creation in the sense of God sets aside Noah and his family and, and, and then there's the whole rest of the world is exiled right and he gets off the ark and there's the rainbow the promise of return how about um, the nations as they grow and I'm, I might be out of order here uh, but the nations grow and grow and grow and they say anything no, we can build it. Yes, we can. Bob the Builder goes to the Old Testament. They, they, we can build a tower to heaven. And, and they try. What happened? Creation. They're creating this thing. I mean, there's the confusion of languages, the exile, you might say, the separation, but the hope. Oh, and, and at the end, what do we see? That all nations one day will be before the throne of God. We can go to Abraham. He's called. God is going to make a nation for him. He, he tells him, this is the land. Go to the land I will show you. It turns out to be Canaan, the promised land. And what does Abraham do more than once? He leaves the land because he, he's like, things are tough here. So he, he kind of exiles himself, 
right? But the promise is always to return. And then he has uh, uh, children, and then they have, but he has a son, primarily, Abraham, Isaac, and then Isaac has a couple sons. Something about the, the sons of these guys kind of head at each other. And Isaac has um, 12 kids, and, and because of this, this and they, his name has changed to Israel, but what happens? He, his whole family is, did I say the wrong one? Yeah. Jacob has changed to Israel, said Isaac. Um, his whole family is exiled, we might say, to Egypt. And then the, one of the greatest motifs of all, the exodus, they, they return. And, and rather than go through every story of creation, exile, then we, then we see just the overall, what, what are we in with? The exile of the whole nation. God creates for himself a nation. They turn from him. They're exiled. You know, creation, sin, exile, and we're left. How does it end? Let them Go on. Dot, dot, dot. Right. There's a return promise. Um, and so, so this order at times allows us to see some of those threads that go through. One last one. This is a little different. Where do we, we'll go on the negative side. Sodom and Gomorrah, everybody's favorite Old Testament story. Thank you. Know, that's all that. Kind of this horrible story, right? Of the destruction of a city. Um, what leads, I mean, this, this really perverse story that's in there of um, these messengers from God that go to the city and they're taken in to a home and the people of the city come knocking on the door and basically the, the offer to protect his guest is that, here, take my daughter instead. And they, I mean, it's just a horrible story, right? Um, and, and the point is, you know, Abraham and Lot, Abraham, Lot pitched his tents towards Sodom, and it's all downhill. Well, we go a little bit further, and we get to the book of Judges. So we're in this section, right? We've moved from, from law to, to, to prophets, more historical. There's this weird story in Judges chapter 19 that's almost Sodom revisited of a Levite who is trying to travel home with his, his new wife, and along the way, stops in a town of Benjaminites and waits in the city square, because that's what you do. You go to the city square hoping somebody will take you in. Somebody finally takes him in, and guess what happens? Knock, knock, knock. And he, his new bride is given to the mob and is killed in the process. Again, an ugly story, right? Um, what's, what's the point of that story? We're at the end of Judges. There's no king in Israel. Israel has become Sodom and Gomorrah. That's the point, that, that this other, you know, the, the outsider, the, the evil people, no, now that's us, which is why Isaiah, which is still in the prophetic section, would say in verses, chapter 1, verse 10, when he's talking to the people of Israel, he, ta- he calls them rulers of Sodom and citizens or people of Gomorrah. So the prophets take that same theme and, and reinforce it. Why do we need to go to exile? Because that which in the beginning was detestable became normative and has to be punished. Creation, sin, exile, return. Another example. The Bible is fascinating. Fascinating. So Denise said, are you going to give him homework? And I said, I haven't really thought about homework. But here's my homework. You're going to be surprised. Read the Bible. (laughs) because <laughs> again let's go back to where we began the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible was written in a different time period comes from a different culture in a different language that expresses itself in different kinds of literature and we as 21st century people pick it up and go why can't I understand it doesn't make sense to me I don't get it it's hard to understand yes but I would suggest that the more and more we immerse ourselves in that literature, the more it begin, you begin to see these things that are in there, these threads that are woven through. And ultimately, the goal is that all of those threads, right? Just like Jesus said um, to his disciples, must, everything must be fulfilled that's written about me. So that's the, that's the ultimate thread we're trying to tie. That's the knot we want to tie. We want to go through all of this and pick up all of these threads to tie it to the person 
of Jesus, who is the word of God, we know, who came and said all of that Old Testament scripture pointed to him, and the better we know it, this is kind of my thesis, I've said it a couple times recently, the, the, one of the best tools we have if not the best tool outside of the gift of the Holy Spirit and all of our lives as Christians to understand the life and ministry of Jesus is the Old Testament. When, when we begin to understand and allow that world to get into us, things that Jesus says and does just kind of whoa, are, become much more meaningful um, to us. How much more do I have that I want to do? Can I stop there? Can I ask a question? Sure. Is there an English Bible that's in the order of the Hebrew Bible? This one. Come on. This is English. Oh, that one there? So it's in that order that you told us. It's, there's Is a, it in, in Chronicles? Like you said? Yeah. Oh. The, the or, this is, um, there are a couple of orders. This one's a little different. There's a, I you can look at the table of contents and see. But yeah, that's. You can buy a Tanakh that's ordered. Found that word. <laughs> T A N A K H. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I thought it was the S at the beginning. Okay, that one. So Torah, Nevi'im, and Katubi. Okay. Did you say Katubi? Katuvim. Okay, sorry. I thought you were Star Wars there with the Southern Man. I was like, awesome. you're mixing your two loves. Yes, Hebrew and Star Wars. Chronologically, what's the earliest book? Chronologically? That's a good question. Um, some spec I don't know off the top of my head. I'll have to look that up. My first guess might be like Job. Job. Job dates from the days of the patriarchs as far as the history, but I don't know. If that's necessarily the case. Obviously, the, the books of Moses, the law would be there, but I'll, I'll get back to you on that one. She's talking about, you mean the recording of it, not necessarily where it starts in history, but you mean, because obviously Genesis is the first historical because it starts with creation. Yeah. But I, I was hearing you ask, what was the first one like written down? And that's why I think it's Joe. Is that what you... You don't know. I okay. I agree. You agree? Okay, then it's settled. <laughs> Martha and I agree. So, so when the chronological Bible that I have, <laughs> first chapter should be Job. First chapter is Genesis one. <laughs> but the next, after you read Genesis, you'll read Job. Okay. Before you go to Exodus, you'll read Job. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I didn't notice that. The one I read. That's how it went. Genesis, go Job, Exodus. Yeah, I'm gonna go check it out. And uh, by the way, oh, I was gonna hold my phone. The uh, what's it called? U Virgin Bible app on there has a one year chronological Bible. That's what I did. Every morning you just open the app and it tells you what to read that day. And in a year you go through the Bible chronologically. Um, some days you'll look and the list is this long because you're reading a little bit of Kings, a little bit of Chronicles, a few lines of a Psalm, and some other things. Um, but it, it's actually a fascinating way to read it. Other questions? Any questions on the, the Zoom stuff? No, I was answering as we went. Okay. So I, want, I, I put this table up here. Well, if you think of questions, we'll have time for that. A few resources if you're curious. Um, these are things that some of them I'm using for this. Some of them just might be worthwhile. You've seen that. Um, this is a brand new book by a seminary professor. Uh, why I Trust the Bible, if you've ever wondered why you can or should, it's, it's a pretty, like it just came it's out last week. The author, so uh, it's M-O-U-N-C-E, -M William Montz, Why I Trust the Bible. Like it literally came out last week. So I just, um, and it's a series of questions. The contradictions in the Bible, the canon, why do we have these books, textual criticism, translation theory. So it's, it's written like that. Um, there's a whole section on the Old Testament, the historicity of the Old Testament, blah, blah, blah. So it's it's a helpful maybe tool. I've not finished it yet. I'm probably halfway through it. Um, I've just kind of been jumping around a little bit, but it was interesting. Um, this one I got from 
our daughter. She's taken a study course at her church in West Palm Beach. Uh, and they're using this. I'd never heard of this book until she mentioned it. 30 Days to Understanding the Bible um, by, by Max Anders, A-N-D-E-R-S. Uh, it is written like a devotional, 15 minutes a day for 30 days. And it goes, it divides the Bible. Let me just, including the New Testament. Let me show you the chart at the end. Basically, the into, what is it, seven? No, into 12 sections from Genesis to Revelation with a major character, a major place, and a major theme in each one of those 12 sections. And it's, it's like a workbook. You're right in it. So every day you read and you fill in a few blanks. And the first thing you do the next day is kind of review what you filled in the day before and add some new blanks. So you just, so it's meant to help reinforce that. And it's, it's very big picture. Can you help me? Story of the Bible kind of a thing. Um, you know, so 30 days to understanding the Bible. Um, of course, this is always a good resource. I covered that. Uh, this is um, a book I'm I'm reading now. I, this is like a, a college level textbook, um, or I don't want to say seminary. It's at Wheaton. I think they're using it. So if you're looking for an easy read, this necessarily isn't it. But it it's um, Dominion and Dynasty: A Theology of the Hebrew Bible by Stephen Dempster. Uh, so, you know, it's getting big picture kind of overview stuff. He, he, he's the one I got a few of those threads that we wove together, like creation, exile, return. He talks about that in this book. Um, so, you know, just as, as an example. Uh, so, again, it's not pick it up and it's not like the 30 days to understand the Bible. <laughs> Do you want me to pass these around? Would that be helpful? If you care to look and see that, um, you're welcome to do that. This is more technical. Uh, you know, a good Bible atlas is always fun. I have one. You're welcome to use. I have a couple. This is like my old seminary one. Um, so we'll probably look at some of these maps and such things. And the good thing is we can throw them up on the screen, big size, not just this size. But a good Bible atlas. Geography is important. In, um, in, in scripture. In fact, I'm sure you would say, having been to the Holy Land, I read a passage like, I was there. I know what they're talking about. When they mentioned this place, this mountain, this field, you know, oh, I went there. Um, so you can't go there in the book necessarily. Uh, I know this is a, gosh, I was in seminary over 30 years ago, an old book and the internet, you can practically go there if you want but I still do a lot of books. Some of those other ones, I'll just leave alone. There. Those are a few. If you're curious, if you want to read, if you want to kind of do some all, the, the 30 days to understand the Bible is like 15 minutes a day of homework. That That's pretty interesting. Um, all right, I'm done with what I have to say. Y'all have any questions? Did I bore you completely? That's <laughs> Thank you. As Denise said on one of the posts you made, it is, we're going to take a little more academic approach to this at times. Um, so if that gets tedious, I'm sorry, because I can get lost in that sometimes. So that's her job afterwards to say. Um, so you have Well, critique. full disclosure, I took Old Testament in college. Oh, oh don't get excited. <laughs> no, no, no. I made a D. <laughs> a D. Because it's hard, so don't be discouraged. This girl was in church since she was six days old, and I sat in that class and cried my eyes out. Like, I don't know. So just, you know, I'll, I'll keep him roped in if he gets too heavy. But I made a D. Yeah, that's it. Uh -huh. And the guy had no pity on my tears. He just looked at me like sad little girl. No pity. Anything else from anybody? We'll do something like this again next week. We'll probably talk a little history, archaeology, uh, geography, I think is where we're going. Um, Are you going to pray? Because several, I'm going to show books to the Zen people when you're done. So okay. don't hang up on it.
Okay, I'm gonna pray. No, I'm just I'm just telling you, don't touch the Zoom because they asked for me to do books. Okay. So I'm going to pray. And be dismissed. Father in heaven, we are grateful that you have revealed yourself to us. Lord, I'm grateful for your word, the Bible, that we we have such access to, to open, to read, to learn from. And Lord, I, I, I pray that as we look at it through this process, this class together, we'll look at it maybe with a little different uh, point of view, in a little different light, and it'll help us understand a little better who you are and the revelation of yourself that you've given us in Scripture. Thank you for especially the gift of Jesus that fulfills all of the the loose ends of the Old Testament, all of the promises, yes and amen, in your Son who is our Savior. Rest in him. We pray in his name. Amen.